cannot continue to do the same old, same old things. The things that were acceptable six months ago are no longer acceptable today. The things you got away with two years ago, you're not going to get away with them anymore because it's a new day in your life. To him who much is given, of him is much required. God expects better from you now. Welcome to Maximize Life, the television broadcast from New Wine Church London. Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. Our mandate is to challenge you to be all you can be. So get ready to be encouraged, enriched, and empowered. You will never be the same again. Now here is your host, Pastor Michael Olaware. Thank you so much for joining us on the broadcast today. This is Maximize Life, where we encourage you to be all that you can be. I am Michael Olaware your host and the senior pastor of New Wine Church in Woolwich, London. Today we are looking at a message by Dr. Tayo Abiemi, the founding pastor of New Wine Church, London, who has gone home to be with the Lord. Today's message is titled, New Beginnings, New Protocol. Be blessed as you watch this program. But over time, they started to compromise. They started the eviction process, but they did not complete it. Tell your neighbor, complete the job. Look at Judges chapter 1 from verse 27 with me. However, Manasseh did not drive out the inhabitants of Bethshean and its villages, or Tanakh and its villages, or the inhabitants of Dor and its villages, or the inhabitants of Ibleam and its villages, or the inhabitants of Megiddo and its villages. For the Canaanites were determined to dwell in that land. How many of you know sometimes there is a habit in your life, you're trying to get rid of it, the thing is stubborn. But you know because it's stubborn doesn't mean it's okay for it to stay. The people were determined, but that's not, it doesn't mean it's okay for them to stay. God said, drive them out. Drive them out means drive them out. And it came to first pass, verse 28. When Israel was strong, that they put the Canaanites under tribute, but did not completely drive them out. Nor did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites who dwelt in Gaza, so the Canaanites dwelt in Gaza among them. Nor did Zebulon drive out the inhabitants of Cretron or the inhabitants of Nahalol. So the Canaanites dwelt among them and were put under tribute. So see what's happening here. They're saying, well, we're stronger than them. We can control them. We can make them do what we want. So it's okay. And that's the way it happens with sin. You think I'm in control. So it's okay. After all, it's only one glass. One glass of whiskey and it's okay. Are you hearing me this morning? But study one, no, did Asher drive out the inhabitants of Arco or, or the inhabitants of Sidon or Elab or Akib, uh, Helba, Afik or Rehob? So the Asherites dwelt among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land, for they did not drive them out. Nor did Naphtali drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh or the inhabitants of Beth Anath, but they dwelt among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land. Nevertheless, the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh and Beth Anath were put under tribute to them. And the Amorites forced the children of Dan into the mountains, for they would not allow them to come down to the valley. And the Amorites were determined to dwell in Mount Harris, in Agilon, and in Shalbim. Yet when the strength of the house of Joseph become, became greater, they were put under tribute. Notice what the children of Israel are doing. The inhabitants of the land, are, are, they're, they're, they're difficult to drive out. So they said, you know what, we're stronger than them. Let's do to them what the Egyptians did to us. Let's enslave them. Let's make them subservient to us. Let's make them pay tributes to us. Let's keep them in control and in check. Now, the first problem with that is this, ladies and gentlemen. If you want to enter into your new beginning, one of the prerequisites is that you need to receive your total healing from your past hurts and your past pain. Because if you don't shut the door on the past, it can become a stumbling block to your future. Who says amen? Why is it important for you to be completely healed? Because oppressed people oppress other people. Hurt people hurt other people. You afflict on other people the pain that was afflicted on you from which you have not been healed. And there are scenes that have been perpetrated down generations because somebody did not break the cycle and shut the door. Tell your neighbor for me, shut the door. And so, 
they did not completely drive the inhabitants of the land out. They gave them a little portion of the land and they said, we will keep you under subjection as the Egyptians kept us under subjection. Now, what is really interesting about this is you must remember that these people we're reading about in the book of Judges are two generations removed from Egypt. They'd been in the wilderness 40 years, that's one generation. They'd entered the land, conquered and divided it for another 30 years. So most of the people who were really slaves in Egypt were dead already. They died in the wilderness. And maybe there were a few young children who were now old in their 70s who entered this story in the book of Judges. But still that spirit perpetuated itself. They did not completely drive the people out of the land. They gave them a little portion of the land to occupy. And that little portion, the enemy turned it into a stronghold. Listen closely. Any room you give the enemy you, in your life will eventually become a stronghold. Whatever you don't totally conquer will eventually conquer you. Are you hearing me today? So I want to charge you. Take an inventory right now. What have I dealt with in my life but I haven't dealt with completely? What have I given a little room in my life? What have I given a little allowance in my life? Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 6, neither give place to the devil. Tell your neighbor for me, no allowance. They made alliances with them. They allowed them to stay and then they started to copy the idolatrous practices of the pagan nations around them. They allow the religions of those nations to affect and influence them. And then they entered into intermarriage with those people. Look at Judges chapter 2 verses 11 to 13. Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Baals. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. And they followed other gods from among the gods of the people who were around them. And they bowed down to them and provoked the Lord to anger. They forsook the Lord and served Baals and the Ashtoreths. Go to chapter 3 verses 5 and 6. Thus the children of Israel dwelt among the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perivites, the Hevites, and the Jebusites. And they took their daughters to be their wives and gave their daughters to their sons and they served their gods. They started to intermarry with the people that God said have nothing to do with. Tell your neighbor for me, if you marry a child of the devil, you will have problems with your father-in-law. Tell them no allowances, no alliances. Now, as a result of these two compromises, God decides to punish Israel. He decides to discipline them. And how does he do it? The very people they made allowances for and made alliances with, God allowed those people to prevail over them. And this begins a cycle that repeats itself over and over and over again all through the book of Judges. And what's that cycle? The people will sin against God. He will raise an oppressor to enslave them. Then they will repent and cry out to God for mercy. And God will raise a deliverer to liberate them. And then things will quiet down for a while. And the people will quickly forget. And they will sin against God again. Take a look at that cycle. And it starts from the bottom with sin. Say sin. And then from sin they go into servitude. Say servitude. And then they cry out to God in supplication. Say supplication. God raises a deliverer for their salvation. Say salvation. There is a quiet period of peace, a period of silence. Say silence. And then they go right back and start with sin again. Say sin. Now this cycle repeats itself in the book of Judges, not once, not twice, but seven times. It's like these people have no brains. And with each subsequent cycle, things are getting worse and worse. And so there is a downward spiral. The sin gets worse, the oppression gets harsher, their prayers get more fervent, the deliverance is stronger and more dramatic, but then they go right back again. They very quickly forget. But each time they call on God, 
God is merciful enough that he forgives them. Each time his mercies prevail. Aren't you glad that we have a God who is never tired of forgiving us? Aren't you glad that we have a God whose mercies are new every morning? And maybe you're here today and you're saying, I've failed God so many times. I don't know if you will even listen to me. Remember, the mercies of God are new every morning. And as long as you repent, God will forgive and he will have mercy. But here, what are the lessons we can learn from the children of Israel to help us in observing our own new beginnings protocol? Number one, re recognize that there is a new order. Recognize that there is now a new order. Tell your neighbor for me, it's a new day. Friend, you are now in a new dispensation if your life, in your life, if you've taken seriously anything we've been saying over the past couple of months, especially the past few weeks and indeed the past few days, you must understand that you're in a new dispensation in your life. You may still live at the same physical address, but you've changed address. It may still be the same physical season, but it's a new season in your life. And you cannot continue with business as usual. There is a new order for this new day. Yesterday's culture will not do for today's promises. So you must recognize it's a new day. God has ushered you into a new dispensation. He has released you into a new season. Things must be different. You cannot continue to do the same old, same old things. The things that were acceptable six months ago are no longer acceptable today. The things you got away with two years ago, you're not going to get away with them anymore because it's a new day in your life. To him who much is given, of him is much required. God expects better from you now. Somebody say amen. amen. Number two, understand the protocol for this season. The Bible says in all you're getting, get understanding. When you move into a new environment, you need understanding. The sons of Issachar had an understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. An understanding of the times instructs you in what you ought to do. You need to have an understanding of the times. You cannot walk around in ignorance. The Bible says do not be ignorant, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Understand the will of God for you in this season. Get intimate with God. Ask him to show you the protocol for this season. Listen to me. For some of you, the protocol is that you must spend more time in prayer. For some of you, the protocol is you must keep your mouth shut. You talk too much. For some of you, the protocol is discipline yourself and your appetites. For some of you, the protocol in this season is that this is a season for you to be generous. It's a new season. Understand what is the protocol. Ask God to tell you, what are the rules of engagement? What are the things I must now do? What was considered excellence at one level becomes mediocrity at another level. So yesterday's order will not do. Number three, be ruthless with sin in your life. Be ruthless with sin in your, listen to me, any sin that you excuse in your life will eventually become your undoing. Are you hearing me? And let me tell you the truth. For most believers, it's not usually the hideous, heinous, terrible, or awful, big, if you like, sins that causes trouble. It's the little compromises, the little foxes that spoil the vine. The dead flies that make the ointment stink. You must come to a place in your walk with God where you develop zero tolerance for sin. Say zero tolerance. Let me tell you the trouble with most believers. Most believers feel that they are the exception to the rule. For everyone else it's not okay. But me and God we are tight. So with me it's okay. After all, I sinned last week and then I came to maximize life and God blessed me. After all, I sinned last week and I'm still anointed today. It's the little foxes that spoil the vine. Adopt a no compromise policy. Tell your neighbor no allowances, no alliances, no compromise. Be careful who or what you allow to influence you 
in a subtle manner. I have discovered if you're facing north and somebody comes to you and says, turn and face out, you tell him, shut up. But if you're facing north and somebody begins to nudge you northeast and gradually northeast east, gradually east, gradually southeast, before you know it, you'll be facing south. Little compromises, little adjustments, little allowances, zero tolerance. Finally, make yourself accountable. And this is probably the most serious thing I want to say today. Make yourself what? Accountable. The undoing of the people in the book of Judges was the Bible says everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And if you take a look at it, that was the beginning of the downfall of this new nation that had just entered their new beginnings. Because after that, after those seven cycles, they ask for a king. They get Saul for king. Then they get David. There is a few years of glory. David compromises. And it's all downhill from there on. Who knows what I'm talking about? Unaccountable people are dangerous people. You didn't hear that, so I'm going to repeat it. Unaccountable people are what? Dangerous people. They are dangerous to themselves and they are dangerous to everyone else. Ask the person next to you, are you accountable? <laughs> tell them, tell me now. Otherwise, I'll get up and sit somewhere else. <laughs> now, let me tell you the big deal with this. Most people in church assume that they are accountable. They deceive themselves into thinking they're accountable. Or they pretend to be accountable. But I can tell you without any fear of contradiction, and I speak with authority on this, the people who are truly accountable in church are a very small minority. Did you hear me? And I want you to start to ask yourself as you sit right now, to whom are you accountable? You yourself. To whom are you accountable? The fact that you say yes to a minister when he passes you in the corridor doesn't make you accountable. Father, you say good morning, pastor, doesn't make you accountable. The fact that you say amen when pastor preaches doesn't make you accountable. The fact that you belong to a team and you show up for meetings on time does not make you accountable. To be accountable means there is somebody who is in your business. There is somebody in your life who can tell you to shut up and sit down. And there will be no questions about it. To whom are you accountable? Who knows your business? Who knows the gory details of your life? How's everything? Everything's okay, Pastor. That's not accountability. You come and have a counseling meeting. When you have a problem and you need prayer, that's not accountability. Accountability is spreading your life open. Now, listen, you cannot be accountable to everybody. What did I say? You cannot be accountable to... Everybody cannot know your business. That is suicide. But let the Holy Spirit speak to you. Walk in discernment. And God will show you someone. Someone who is spiritually mature. Someone who is wise. Someone who understands the word of God and the counsel of God. And someone who can speak into your life. Someone who respects you. Who respects your destiny. Who respects your privacy. Who will keep your confidentialities. You know if you tell them you are not going to hear it on BBC. And you need someone like that. And don't even sit there and tell me, Pastor, I haven't found anybody like that. For five years, you haven't found one person. There's something wrong with you. Liar, liar. Make yourself accountable. You men in the house. Your wife must have the phone number of one person who can tell you to shut up and sit down. But also you women, you women, make yourself accountable. And that your friend that you gossip with all the time who tells you the nasty things you should do to your husband, that's not accountability. That's a dangerous person in your life. I'm talking about someone who is sober, who is wise, maybe an older woman who can speak into your life and call you to order. Because I know this submission, submit to your husband thing is not, it's old-fashioned, right? So, 
<laughs> make yourself accountable. You let me tell you something. If you don't make yourself accountable, somebody will make you accountable. And it may be someone who doesn't like you. Are you hearing me? I've heard Dr. Bernard say this over and over again, and he said it at dinner during this past um, weekend. Uh, he said, present at the inception of every good thing are the seeds of its own destruction. Present at the inception of every good thing. If the devil cannot keep you from entering your new beginnings, he will try to destroy you inside your new beginnings. Did you hear me? Do you remember the story of Balaam and Balak? Balak did not want the people of God to prevail. He wanted to destroy them. He knew that he couldn't come against them. He had heard of the exploits of their God. So he sent for this sorcerer Balaam. And he says, come and curse them for me. And Balaam says, I will curse them. But he opened his mouth. He wanted to curse them, but a blessing came out. Why? Because they were a blessed people. And listen to me, friend. You are a blessed people. It's not possible to curse you. Balaam opened his mouth and, and Balak said, why did you bless them? He said, I tried. He said, I looked in the book. He said, I couldn't find anything against them. He said, there is no enchantment against Jacob. There is no divination against Israel. There is no hex. There is no jinx. There is no spell. There is no juju. There is no voodoo. I cannot cause them. They are blessed. He said, I've received a command to bless and I must bless them. And that is your portion. Any direction you turn, you have to be blessed. No man can curse you because God has justified you. No one can condemn you. But then Balaam said something to Balak. He said, I can't curse them, but I can teach you how to get them to curse themselves. He said, God has defined a parameter for them. God has established a protocol for them. If you can lure them out of those parameters... If you can cause them to break the protocol, they're finished. The book of Jude and the book of Revelation calls it the error of Balaam. And indeed, the children of Israel fell. When the curses of Balaam could not get them, their own compromises got them. Tell your neighbor, destroy the seed before it destroys the good thing. We're going to spend the next two weeks in the book of Judges. But for the last time today, tell somebody for me, new beginnings, new protocol. I trust that this message has enriched you and challenged you to be all that you can be. If you have any question, comment, or prayer request about what you have heard today, do not hesitate to contact me using the details on your screen, and I will be glad to serve you as best as I can. Also, if you live in or visiting the London, Exeter, or Kent area of the United Kingdom, feel free to worship with us at New Wine Church. All our service details are on your screen right now. Well, till the next time on Maximize Life, stay blessed.